On the Spot with Michelle McCory is brought to you by Prime XBT. Canada is now the latest country to advance a CBDC agenda. The Bank of Canada is asking for public feedback on a digital Canadian dollar, and Canadians have until June 19th to weigh in on a Canadian central bank digital currency. Meanwhile, in Brazil, the central bank is readying plans to launch a CBDC as soon as 2024. The Central Bank of Montenegro recently announced a pilot project for a CBDC with Ripple. In the UK, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has been very supportive of focusing on developing a CBDC. And the Bank of England seems to be moving forward with work on a digital pound, as evidenced by job postings with CBDC-related titles posted on the bank's website. The Bank of England says it is well advanced in the building and implementation of a new central bank real-time payment system. And similarly, the U.S. Federal Reserve has announced that its FedNow instant 24-7 payment network will be fully launched in July. Now, this is widely seen as laying the groundwork or facilitating a CBDC. And keep in mind that in March of 2022, U.S. President Joe Biden issued Executive Order 14067, which facilitates the development of digital assets, including CBDCs. So just to recap, generally speaking, a central bank digital currency is the digital form of a country's fiat currency. A CBDC is issued and regulated by a nation's monetary authority or central bank. It is programmable, so it can be modified to work or not work in certain transactions, and it allows authorities to monitor every single payment made and received, obliterating financial privacy and anonymity. Now, supporters of CBDCs claim that they will prevent money laundering, deter criminal activities, help maintain law and order, and that they will improve the speed and security of transactions, can be used to fine-tune monetary policy, and allow for financial inclusion. Critics warn that CBDCs are the ultimate tool of control, censorship, and surveillance. Well, either way, 11 countries have already launched a CBDC, and 114 countries are in various stages of developing one. And my next guest warns that CBDCs would cause financial privacy to vanish entirely and could be abused for political gain. He also advocates for a CBDC defensive portfolio and will be breaking down exactly what that involves. John Butler is the investment and editorial director at South Bank Investment Research and author of The Golden Revolution and The Golden Revolution Revisited. John has over 25 years of experience in finance, having previously served in senior positions at Deutsche Bank and Lehman Brothers. John, very good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, Michelle. All right, John, a lot to discuss, but before we do that, let's firstly get a little bit more background on what a CBDC is in general. And again, an idea initially launched in China by the People's Bank of China, which arguably that in itself should give us some cause for concern. But remind our viewers about what the basics are of a CBDC. Well, it's a purely digital currency, one that has no physical representation as paper or anything else that could ever be physically withdrawn from the financial system. It is basically a bunch of ones and zeros maintained on some sort of central database where, of course, you can exchange your ones and zeros with other people and institutions within that database. What that means, of course, is that a full switchover from a system that allows at least some method of physical withdrawal to one that allows no method of physical withdrawal means that the entire financial system becomes gated in a network, which is ultimately, although they might kind of downplay this, is ultimately under the control of whatever entity sets it up and is legally authorized to regulate it and run it. And of course, you know, that would be the, the central bank, presumably. So, I mean, that, that's what you're looking at here. You're looking at a technology. And to be fair, no technology need necessarily be abused or misused. You could argue that all technologies have potentially positive purposes. 
or rather nefarious ones. But this is one where many people believe that because of the way in which it's coming about and the institutions bringing it about and the lack of full public transparency or democratic control over some of these institutions gives one pause for thought. Yes, and one of the institutions leading the way with getting central bank digital currencies adopted is the BIS, or the Bank of International Settlements, the central bank for central banks, if you will. And the general manager of the BIS, Augustine Karstens, he's made it very clear that CBDCs give central banks absolute control over financial transactions and will enable governments to monitor transactions and then enforce rules in a way that they simply cannot do with cash. He laid out the agenda very clearly. Let's take a listen. Our analysis on CBDC in particular for the use of general, to the general use, uh, we tend to establish the equivalence with cash. Uh, and there is a huge difference there. Uh, for example, in cash, uh, we don't know, for example, who's using a $100 bill today. We don't know who is using a 1,000 peso bill today. Uh, a key difference in, with the CBDC is that central bank will have absolute control on the rules and regulations that will determine the use of that uh, expression of central bank liability. And also we will have the technology to enforce that. Those, are, those two issues are extremely important and that makes a huge difference with respect to what, she, to what cash is. There you have it, John. He's basically laying out the case why you want to get rid of cash and implement a central bank digital currency if you are, in fact, the one in control. What do you say to that? Well, from his perspective, it is understandable. So much easier to deal with a bank run, a withdrawal of deposits that could be destabilizing by making it impossible to withdraw those deposits in physical form, that is paper, cash, or other physical assets. And so from the regulator's perspective, from a top-down perspective where you, know, you have the control, you're holding the hammer, you want everything to be a nail that you can just whack the moment it begins to behave in a way that doesn't suit your policy agenda. And so I get it. Absolutely. Look, CBDCs are a monetary technology. They are a technology that would facilitate top-down control throughout the system, right down, as you've mentioned, to the individual transaction. Now, they'll claim that would allow them to police fraud in the system, that would allow them to try to get nefarious activities, black market activities out of the system. And yes, okay, fine. I mean, if their heart's in the right place and they're actually competent, maybe that would be facilitated by CBDCs. But the dark side here is so vast. I mean, it might be dark, but it's so vast. It should be of deep, deep concern to those who still value the role that financial privacy plays in a modern, liberal, free, progressive democracy. But it's more than just that, John. I mean, obviously, he said privacy will go out the window, and he illustrated the example of how you can't track cash, but you will be able to track, uh, track, track a central bank digital currency. It's also this idea of potential government overreach. And we saw very clear examples of that during COVID, where we saw governments take actions that we wouldn't think they would ever take before. But given the crisis and the opportunity that it presented, we saw governments take tremendous liberties with curtailing freedoms, curtailing movement, imposing curfews, imposing restrictions on how many people can gather where. We saw, especially in Canada, very, uh, very famously, when the administration of uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau blocked off the truckers who were protesting against the vaccine from access to the financial system. Whether you agree with them or not is another question, but their ability to protest a decision that they weren't happy with was curtailed by the fact that they were taken off the financial system with an emergency act. Not only that, people donating to them were also taken off the financial system. When you have a programmable currency, it becomes so much easier to do that. And it also brings in this idea 
of people self-censoring, people being afraid that they could be taken out of the system and then just not acting accordingly. So break down this idea of the potential dangers of a programmable currency. Oh, I agree. The potential dangers are vast. And indeed, even one with a vast imagination might struggle to find every conceivable way in which this sort of monetary technology could be abused. You, you've pointed out a very prominent example. My word, it would have been so much easier for you know, whoever it was making the decisions here, Justin Trudeau or others in his cabinet or those at the Bank of Canada, it would have been so much easier mechanically in terms of time to reprogram whatever algorithm within the CBDC to use AI to search for whatever spending characteristics people happened to be exercising at the time that showed some pattern recognition with behavior characteristic of someone who might conceivably support the protesters in future, even if they weren't supporting them today. This sort of dystopian world that has been, let's face it, fairly thoroughly explored by a lot of modern science fiction would go from fiction to reality in short order if those in power chose to abuse the power that CBDCs would hand them uh, it, uh, over the entire financial system. Well, you know, abuse is in many ways a subjective term. Some could say governments will uh, restrict people's uh, use of uh, fossil fuels for what they deem to be the greater good of you know preventing uh, more climate change issues you could see a situation where the government will say you've exceeded your carbon output allowance for the month you've taken too many flights you've eaten too much red meat you've you've used too much gas in your gasoline powered car assuming we still have those in the future and then your money doesn't work to make transactions that facilitate more carbon output and you know it's a, arguably to some a matter of perspective you could say well it's not abuse, it's for the greater good. Do you see the idea of a central bank digital currency linked to a so-called social credit score? Or do you think that they're not necessarily have to be one in the same? They don't have to be one in the same, but sadly, the track record of governments in modern times is that when they do accrue incremental new powers, the tendency is to not use those powers to facilitate bottom up social interaction and value add to the broader society, but rather to impose specific preferences representing specific, sometimes very narrow interests from the top down. Uh, that is almost by definition abuse, unless you think that somehow there is this enlightened elite running the show uh, that would govern us better than we could somehow govern ourselves through a somewhat more bottom-up democratic process. So I absolutely uh, can identify with anyone who shares those sorts of concerns. And so, yes, I am among that group who believe that moving headlong towards CBDCs in the current political context is very dangerous. That said, if you if you if we lived in you know the world of the 19th century or something when you know the government as a size of the economy was far smaller, regulations were few and far between, most people went through you know years of their life without any material contact with uh, with a federal government, be it in Canada, the United States, or elsewhere. Now, that was a very different world. Nowadays, it becomes a very frightening proposition to hand over any and all financial privacy to some central organization. And imagine what that kind of means. It also means the end of fiscal policy being independent, because whoever is in charge of this new, totally electronic digital monetary regime, they can literally write in algorithms that, that will implicitly withhold taxes, entirely freeze non-qualifying non transactions, favor certain individuals over others, depending on you know, whether their serial number fits a given class or category of privileged persons. This could go in so many dystopian directions. Again, it's difficult to have the fullness of imagination that would be mm -hmm. required to countenance them all. Uh, so yes, we absolutely should be aware of this. We absolutely should be putting the brakes on it. And if they do choose to move in this direction, be very afraid. Absolutely. 
Well, let's talk about how it's moving in the UK. You're joining us from the United Kingdom. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is an advocate of Britcoin, the central bank digital currency for the United Kingdom. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. Today, I'm proud to say that under the UK's presidency, the group of the world's seven most advanced economies, the G7, is launching a set of public policy principles for retail central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. Central bank digital currencies could be a digital version of money, a bit like a digital banknote that could be used alongside physical notes and coins. Unlike most of the digital money people use daily today, it would be issued directly by a central bank, like the Bank of England in the UK. Well, he went on basically espousing the virtues of Bitcoin. Firstly, what is the current status of the development of Bitcoin? Do we have a timeline there? There's not a specific timeline for anything other than the periodic study or periodic review that they put out for comment. But the momentum is clearly going in this direction and it's building in this direction to the point where there are job applications being posted for people uh, to come in to either the Bank of England or Her Majesty's Treasury to advise on the further development of Britcoin. So this is advancing, absolutely, uh, notwithstanding no clear date on when the switch might suddenly be thrown. And indeed, given how controversial this is likely to be, you could argue that there, no, there won't be a fixed time to do it. That is, they'll wait for the crisis to come that they will not let go to waste and seize the initiative during a crisis to say, okay, we do need to intervene to rescue the system, to protect you, the depositor, from weak banks, you know, mismanagement, you know, fraud, whatever it is. So we're going to step in and flip the switch now and go wholesale over to CBCs so you won't have to worry about any of those risks of the banking sector anymore. It might well be done that way in, in much the same way that some of the uh, emergency powers that were assumed in the global financial crisis of 2008-2009 by various central banks and governments have really never been rescinded, right? You know, they've held on to it and they reserved the right to intervene in similar fashion at any future point in time. Right. Well, John, if they're looking for a crisis to roll out CBDCs, we could be on the verge of one. I mean, we're starting to see signs of this banking crisis. In the U.S., we've had the second biggest bank collapse in U.S. history with First Republic Bank. Three of the four largest ever U.S. bank failures have occurred since March. Dozens of regional banks in the U.S. could be in trouble, especially with the Fed continuing to tighten rates. And of course, we have the issue of U.S. Treasuries issued a few months ago already losing their mark-to-market value as interest rates continue to rise. That's very problematic for the banking sector. And we're also potentially seeing that sort of contagion spread to the rest of the world. Of course, we had Credit Suisse collapse in March as well. So do you see this banking crisis potentially escalating to a level which could force a reset and could bring about the implementation of CBDCs? Absolutely. Absolutely. If there's one thing that modern financial history would tell you is that behind every small domino, there's a larger domino. And we've gone through multiple iterations of this now. And I mean, certainly 2008, 2009 was particularly instructive in that regard. But in the United States, there's also the savings and loan crisis from the late 80s, early 90s. And indeed, people forget there, there were some very significant bank failures, including Continental Bank of Illinois in the United States, following the very dramatic policy tightening by Fed Chairman Paul Volcker uh, back in the early 1980s. The fact is, ever since we went off the gold standard, we've unleashed historic instability in the banking system. Many mainstream economists will say, oh, well, it's nothing like the Great Depression. Well, it actually depends. The size of the financial sector during the Great Depression was so much smaller than it is today as a share of overall uh, GDP, overall the overall economy, that even though it was pretty bad in its own terms, vis-a-vis -vis the economy at large, it actually was arguably not as big 
as what has, has, is, has been happening more recently. Now, we may not feel the economic effects to the same degree because of the excessive inflationism being used to fight the natural deflationary forces to try and debubble this financial system that has become so unstable. But this tug of war between the constant inflationism coming from central monetary authorities to try and prevent an implosion of bad credit, bad debt, bad God knows what, you can't even see it anymore, it's so opaque. In the financial system, this is going to remain a major, if not the dominant, dynamic within banking and finance until we go through some sort of proper reset, some sort of proper deleveraging back to a financial and banking system less dependent on constant inflationism from the central banks. Well, you, you recently wrote a paper in the South Bank Investment Research in your report there, and you highlighted some of the risks and potential benefits of CBDCs, again, a matter of perspective. But you say that they make bank runs impossible. And again, this is particularly salient now that we've dealt with a series of bank runs and bank failures. So how would CBDCs prevent bank runs? How could this bank run situation be used to, again, if you could walk us through that, bring about a CBDC? Well, in many respects, it would be his, a historical echo of what Franklin Delano Roosevelt did in the United States in 1933 and 34 to try and end the first phase of the Great Depression. What he did was he said, hey, um, I'm aware there's a, a run on the banks, but because we're still on the gold standard, it's a run on the gold reserves of the banks. And so he wrote into law that it was illegal to withdraw any further gold from the banks and that any gold remaining in private hands was to be submitted back to the banks or it would be forcibly confiscated by the government under criminal penalties. This, in some ways, is quite similar. They're basically saying, hey, we're not going to allow you to withdraw any of your funds from the banks anymore. Your funds will have to stay in the banks. And indeed, we're simply going to even remove the physical possibility that you could pull any physical anything out of the banking system, be it paper, be it gold in custody, be it any physical asset whatsoever. So in the same way that FDR used this unprecedented and I would argue completely unconstitutional set of actions to try and deal with the Great Depression, uh, we might see something similar this time around the current banking crisis escalates. Well, as this banking crisis escalates, we're seeing potential for more and more consolidation in the banking sector. How do you see that playing out? Because I know you recently wrote another piece where you said that big banks can always outcompete the smaller banks due to economies of scale and therefore drive the small financial companies out of business, leading to increasingly greater consolidation over time. So break that down for us. Well, look, finance is a scalable business, and so it is naturally gravitating towards economies of scale. That said, that has been hugely accelerated by the fact that local knowledge in banking almost no longer matters. Local economic conditions, place to place, region to region, state to state, province to province, they don't really matter much anymore because so much economic power and control is directed centrally from above. So you don't get these regional variations, local knowledge about how well the economy is doing, who you should lend to and, and how much doesn't really matter so much anymore. And so local banks don't have any local competitive informational edge. Those who do have the competitive informational edge are those who can pick up the phone and speak to the monetary authorities in their country and get some insight into what their next move is going to be in terms of credit conditions. That sort of cronyism lends itself to reinforcing the natural economies of scale that can accrue to big finance, big banking. And so this helps to explain why things have been going the way they've been going for decades. What's happening now only accelerates it. I mean, the Fed is practically explicit now in coming out and saying, well, gee, other factors equal. If you're a slightly larger bank, we're slightly more likely to bail out your depositors in the event you get into trouble. What sort of message does that send to depositors in relatively smaller banks? 
It's basically telling them, get out now while you still can and migrate your deposits to a larger institution that has a hotline to the Fed if they ever need a little help due to their own bad lending decisions and practices. And so that's really where we're at now. And to be honest, it's kind of shameful. I mean, this is this is not just crony capitalism in disguise. It's crony capitalism out in the open. And it's something of which everyone in charge of financial re and banking regulatory policy nowadays should look in the mirror and be deeply ashamed of themselves. Well, I don't know if uh, they're ashamed, John. I mean, especially when you consider that we still have a Federal Reserve continuing to tighten in the face of all of these collapses as they fight inflation, which uh, they claimed was transitory to begin with. But seeing as we mentioned the U.S. Federal Reserve, I do want to get your thoughts on what Fed Chair Jerome Powell said about CBDCs. He said that it should have four characteristics. And again, I'd like to remind our viewers that arguably in the U.S., it would need to be approved by Congress. I don't think that the Federal Reserve would be able to just implement a CBDC. But let's take a listen to how Powell described the four characteristics of a U.S. CBDC. We think that there are four characteristics of if we were to pursue a CBDC, it would at a minimum have the following four characteristics. First is intermediated. Second is private, privacy protected. But third is identity verified. So it would not be anonymous. It would not be an anonymous bearer instrument. And fourth is transferable or interoperable. So, so we're, we would be looking to balance privacy protection with identity verification, which is which has to be done, of course, in today's traditional banking system as well. So he talks about protecting users' privacy, but at the same time says identity verification and saying it wouldn't be anonymous. I mean, that sounds like a contradiction to me. What do you make of that? Well, absolutely. And as, as look, as I mentioned earlier, and as we discussed earlier, clearly uh, one of the benefits from the regulator's point of view in moving towards an entirely CBDC-based system is that anonymity is totally lost, privacy is totally lost. And what that means is that nowadays what we understand as the black economy, which, you know, depending on where you live in the world, uh, it might be a small portion of the economy, maybe only 10% or so. In other parts of the world, it might be 30, 40, 50% or more. It depends where, uh, where money is unstable, where inflation is high, uh, where the drug trade or other black market trades are particularly dominant. Economists try to get data on the black market, but it's black. It's hard, right? It's opaque. It's hard to see what's going on there. And so what happens is that all of those black market activities, right down to begging for food in the street, they end up becoming barter economies. And as we know, barter economies are hugely efficient, especially in the modern world, vis-a-vis -vis a non-barter medium of exchange-based economy. And so what CBDCs will do indirectly, although again, policymakers will deny this, is that they will basically throw anyone whose life is dependent on cash in hand for handouts, for a little uh, you know, sort of money to buy food at, at night, um, but also, of course, drug dealers or anyone else who is uh, providing a good or a service that people in the economy want, but for whatever reason is not favored by the powers that be. And so one of the benefits, again, from the regulator's point of view, is that it will make those sorts of black market activities, however voluntary, um, very easy to prohibit and gum them up uh, and make them hugely inefficient as a result of forcing them to rely on direct barter rather than being able to use the medium of exchange uh, provided by the government regulator. So, John, most of the central banks that have spoken out about central bank digital currencies assure people that cash will not be taken out of the system, that this will be a complement to cash. The Bank of England has said that, for example. Do you buy that? No. <laughs> I think that's, again, it's just, it's, you, 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 you get... You know, you, you look at history and you get this perspective and you you get governments reassuring people that, well, we're going to acquire these new powers, but they won't be used for that. I, and it just never works out that way. I'm, I'm so, Look, I've become deeply skeptical at my advanced age. I mean, you, you just get to a point where you've seen so many violations of those sorts of reassurances that you just don't take them seriously anymore. 
And, yeah. and this to me is just the latest example of a government reassuring us that, oh, don't worry about it. We're going to acquire this potentially vast and potentially easily abused new power, but we won't go there. Um, I just don't buy it. Well, John, we saw a very interesting situation play out in Nigeria recently, which has seen the adoption of the e-Naira, the CBDC there, surge after a severe cash shortage, which some could argue was engineered by the central bank there. As a recap, late last year, the central bank said that it was replacing the old 200, 500 and 1000 Naira notes with new ones, told Nigerians that they have to turn them in. They can't use them after the deadline, won't be recognized as legal tender. Okay, we've seen that happen in other countries. The UK, not too long ago, withdrew old paper pound notes from circulation, said they were going to be replacing them with more durable plastic ones. That happened rather smoothly and over a longer period of time. But in Nigeria, after people turned in the old banknotes, then they were told that the banks had run out of the new cash notes and there was a cash shortage and people were in fact forced to go digital with the e-Naira. And as you would expect, adoption of the e-Naira surge, transactions up 63% so far this year, over 13 million e-wallets have been opened. And prior to this, the adoption of the e-Naira was very low. There was somewhat of a reluctancy to adopt it, although other cryptocurrency adoption is quite high in Nigeria. The government also has been using their CBDC to pay Nigerians welfare, saying if you want to get paid, you have to download e-wallets. So essentially, in Nigeria, through this cash crunch, they have forced Nigerians into the digital system. Do you see other governments potentially using measures like this? Well, absolutely. I mean, arguably the most prominent example of all is India which totally out of the blue overnight uh, completely demonetized lots of large bills. They had to be brought into the banks in exchange for smaller bills. And that led to tremendous chaos because India as a very large and in terms of per capita income, still relatively poor country, is hugely dependent on cash in hand just to get food on the table day to day, just to get a shirt on your back day to day. And so people that you know are living hand to mouth in a society like India, it was hugely disruptive of them. You no, know, very, very disruptive. Now you could say, oh, but a wealthy country wouldn't have the same problems. Well, tell that to the relatively poor in the wealthy country. I'm not sure that's the case. You know, are are politicians and central bankers and financial regulators willing to risk throwing all of these people under the bus uh, just so that their you know grand monetary experiment succeeds? Um, again, they'll claim that they're not taking any sort of risk like that at all, that they'll never get rid of cash entirely, and that they would certainly give ample fair warning thereof. But one wonders, uh, given the history of this elsewhere. Well, wondering is one thing, John, but let's get to what one can actually do. And you've written extensively on how to protect one's portfolio from this threat posed by CBDCs. So what are the various steps, what are the various investments that people can make that help hedge against the risk of CBDCs. Walk us through that. Yes, look, if you're not going to get full on dystopian here and just try to be practical and work within the system as it currently exists and take prudent for, uh, pr uh, pr uh, preparative measures to try and insulate yourself from the effects this might have in its initial stages, what you absolutely want to do first thing is understand that what you consider to be cash in the bank today is not the same thing as cash in the bank after the introduction of a CBDC. It means you might not be able to get access to that cash in exegesis, and it means that that cash may not only be subject to low interest rates that don't protect you from inflation, but potentially outright negative interest rates that you cannot escape by withdrawing physical notes and coins from the monetary system. And so your, your cash is at risk in multiple new ways once CBDCs are introduced. And therefore, what you want to try and do, and again, you must do this prudently and carefully, you want to try and source your liquidity through cash 
flow rather than a cash hoard. Now, of course, you can do that just by having a job and making sure you're always receiving a steady income and making sure that your employer it increases your wages to keep up with inflation such that your cash flow is keeping up with that over time if indeed you are living through an inflationary environment. But what about investments? This is where the danger is going into fixed income investments as some sort of defensive move. It's no longer defensive to be in fixed income in a CBDC world because the negative interest rates that can be imposed on cash by extension and bootstrapping up the yield curve effectively are being imposed across that yield curve such that even long dated bonds could end up resulting in effectively zero or negative yields and you wouldn't be able to do anything about it and there would be no way out of that system. So bonds lose their ability to act as defensive investments in a CBDC world in exiges, in extreme circumstances. However, equities might be at risk. Let's face it, this could all be hugely disruptive for economic growth, for corporate profits. The equity market might take a whack. And so if you're going to look at equity markets and try to find a potential safe haven there and a source of cash liquidity, you go for current income. You go for dividends. You go and invest in firms that are in a position to increase prices alongside inflation, to increase dividends alongside inflation, to pay you a steady, effectively inflation-adjusted coupon of fresh cash as we go through what could be a very challenging economic period. So you get your inflation-adjusted fresh cash deposit in the system month to month rather than relying on the erosion of a cash hoard you've accumulated or a bond uh, portfolio you've accumulated. There's no perfect solution, but that's a start. And the other start, as it were, although arguably some would say more perfect, hold precious metals. Get your hands on precious metal exposure. You can get it through physical metal stored outside the banking system with a precious metal custodian. That's always a very prudent thing to do in any case, if you're concerned about either inflation or a financial crisis. And then back to what I just mentioned about the equity market, there are some precious metal producers who are cash generative, who pay dividends, who have lots of proven metal in the ground that they get out at a steady, reliable rate. That is a, a source of protection against the potential abuses of CDBCs. So look, right. there's no simple answer as an investor to a world that becomes ever more dystopian, but there are prudent measures one can take now within the current system, within the current legal and regulatory framework that would help to deal with might be the initial negative impacts of a move to CBDCs, even if it never goes full or well yet on us. John, before I elaborate on the idea of gold and precious metals, I do want to circle back to this idea of equities because you have recommended being overweight six stock market sectors, energy and utilities, mining and materials, chemicals, consumer non-discretionary, waste disposal and recycling, and transportation and logistics. Quickly break down why those sectors. They all share a few things in common. They all reside primarily quite low on what I call the economic value chain. That is, they don't depend on all kinds of other very complex, technologically advanced industrial processes, all working as efficiently as possible with just-in-time inventories and everything else. They can get gummed up when you get into supply shocks such as that that much of the world's been, been experiencing uh, both during and coming out of the COVID pandemic. So that's number one. They're low on the economic value chain. Number two, they tend to have strong pricing power and stable margins. So if for any reason their input and operating costs do begin to rise due to inflation, they're able to pass those rising costs on to their uh, their, their customers, be they other businesses or be they consumers. And so that provides inflation protection. And finally, 
these tend to be highly cash generative industries that are not dependent on possibly very optimistic long-term growth assumptions the way for example the tech industry is and so if people get defensive and get concerned about the future course of the economy due to the introduction of CBDCs or anything else by that matter, they're naturally a place to hide against that sort of longer term structural economic uncertainty. Don't get me wrong. Some of them are still cyclical and their share prices will still rise and fall with a typical normal business cycle. But the structural risks we're discussing here, that's what they're largely, if not completely, immune from. They're structural safe havens against chronic stagnation, which sadly, I'm afraid, is something we may be facing today. But John, in, in this environment, you're still receiving your payment in a central bank digital currency. And I get that investing in these sectors helps against inflation, stagflation, and a potential devaluation of that fiat form in CBDC. But let's talk about gold and particularly physical gold. How do you see that as a way to protect your portfolio in a world where CBDCs are implemented? Well, look, gold holds its value. If you're facing low interest rates, zero interest rates, negative interest rates, at that point, gold actually has a relative positive rate of return vis-a-vis -a, -vis a bank deposit or a government bond, for example. So gold actually becomes materially more attractive as a store of value in a low or zero rate world, one that CBDCs would find it easy to implement because there's no escape from the system at that point. So gold's traditional timeless, I would argue, store of value properties are actually enhanced by the introduction of CBDCs in that simple way. There's a more subtle way. And the subtle way is this. There are countries, including the United States of America, the, the, the United Kingdom too, but let's focus on the United States of America here because the US is the issuer of the overwhelmingly dominant global transaction and reserve currency. If the US moves to a digital dollar, it is possible that certain foreign actors especially those who might be subject to some form of economic sanctions, find it more difficult to avoid those sanctions due to the complete lack of financial privacy within the system. We've seen all the pushback against the use of the dollar following all of the sanctions imposed on Russia and Russia's trading partners ever since the war in Ukraine kicked off. Well, if you want to dial up the, you know, dial up the volume on that, that the move to CBDCs would be a very good way to do it. You would certainly catalyze a tremendous acceleration by Russia, China, Brazil, India, South Africa, the BRICS, and all the member countries of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and anyone else who was concerned that someday they might end up on the bad side of the United States for whatever policy reason, they would see a much more urgent need to find a way to escape the dollar. But as the dollar is the bedrock of the system currently, any move away to something else implies the dollar is going to lose the premium that it enjoys in terms of currency strength and relatively low uh, interest rates when it becomes de when the world becomes somewhat, not all at once necessarily, de-dollarized and the dollar is dethroned from this position. But then everyone says, oh, but that can't happen. There's nothing to replace the dollar. I disagree. There is absolutely something to replace the dollar. And that's the thing that existed before even the dollar itself did. And that is physical gold, precious metals in particular, physical gold. That could once again become the bedrock of an international monetary system. Modern monetary technology would make it very easy for the BRICS for the SCO members or anyone else for that matter to agree on some neutral jurisdictions in which they would store physical base money, gold, and then issue banknotes that were claims on that base money supply. A new international gold standard could arise out of the crisis of de-dollarization that might be sparked by the U.S. implementation of a CBDC combined with a sanctions regime on much of the world at large. 
And again, people might say, oh my God, that's fantastic. That could never happen that way. They haven't done their history. The classical gold standard of the 19th century arose precisely out of a breakdown in international monetary affairs. There was general distrust and discontent that currencies would honor their pegs to gold and or silver. And they gravitated towards a system that allowed them to continue trading with each other and yet built credibility back into the system. And that unleashed the most rapid, sustained economic growth in recorded human history. It could all happen again if people just opened their minds and opened their history books. So this may all sound very dark indeed, but there might be a very silver lining or golden lining lying in the future. Well, John, we do have uh, the BRICS meeting to discuss this new global reserve asset in South Africa later this year. There is speculation that it could be backed by gold to some degree or a basket of other commodities. And the thinking is that this would, in fact, be a digital currency on some kind of blockchain, but backed by commodities. But you're saying that the advent or, or the acceleration of central bank digital currencies elsewhere, particularly the Fed coin or one linking back to dollars, would accelerate that move to a central bank reserve asset by the BRICS. And I'll remind our viewers that over 19 countries now want to join the BRICS, but it would accelerate the move to a central bank digital currency by the BRICS, potentially or most likely backed by gold. Absolutely. Because gold is the only asset that everybody can agree to disagree about. Look, everybody would love to have their own CBDC. Everybody would love to have their own digital printing press and to abuse it however they want to abuse it for personal, national uh, advancement, power projection, whatever it might happen to be. But if you want to trade with other countries, that's not going to fly. You're going to have to agree on a neutral asset to be a neutral benchmark and store of value so that no one player in the game has an advantage over other players. That's Game Theory 101. That's what we learned from John Nash. Watch the film The Beautiful Mind and you'll see what I'm getting at. This is the game theory of international monetary relations and the equilibrium in a world in which countries don't necessarily trust each other, in which they don't really think they want to risk sanctions being imposed, Gold is the only game theoretic solution for a world that is nevertheless highly dependent on trade. Nobody wants to go back to economic autarky. Nobody wants to try to live completely within their own borders without external trade. If they want to continue doing so, gold is the only known proven way in which to do that. We are going back to the future. Gold is going to be in our monetary future to help settle international trade. So, John, up to now, gold priced in dollars. What would that mean? And we've seen dollar strength impacting gold price. How do you see gold priced, if you will, in this scenario that you say could be happening in the future? Look. S several hundred years ago, a series of brilliant astronomers realized step by step, Copernicus, Brahe, Kepler, and Newton, that it wasn't the Earth at the center of the solar system, or by extension, the universe in, in their minds. It was the sun. And when they placed the sun at the center of the solar system, they so greatly simplified astronomical calculation, truth became easier to understand in all aspects of physics. And one fabulous uh, discovery after another followed on that reorientation to placing the sun rather than the earth at the center of the solar system, placing gold at the center of the international monetary system rather than the dollar would do the exact same thing. The gold would not be priced in terms of currencies. Currencies would be priced in terms of gold and therefore would all need to compete on a level playing field for which one offered the most attractive interest rates in gold terms, which one of them offered the greatest security of deposits when simply sitting in physical gold 
was an option. It would make economic calculations so much easier that global trade would become so much more optimized, so much more efficient, subject, of course, to politicians and regulators simply getting out of the way and allowing the international marketplace and goods and services to work its magic. It would lead to a golden age for international commerce. So That's it seems where bit, we can get to if we just let nature take its course. It seems a bit silly then to say what would the price of gold be in that scenario if gold, as you say, will be what everything would be priced in. Which is exactly the way things worked under the gold standard. People might have counted their banknotes in sterling or they might have counted them in Canadian dollars or whatever it was. But they knew what a Canadian dollar was. They knew the definition of it was a weight of silver or gold. The same was true of pounds. The same was true of dollars. And so when it came to international trade, you didn't have to guess with these wild assumptions about, oh, gee, you know, what, what future exchange rate is it actually going to be? What future interest rate is it actually going to be? It all reduced to gold. And it allowed for far more efficient uh, capital allocation, far more efficient right. development of global trade. And everyone benefited as a result, hence the highest observed global growth in recorded human history. Uh, John, very quickly, I do need to get your thoughts, though, of what gold means in a CBDC world in terms of if an individual holds gold and doesn't want to partake in a system where transactions are surveilled and, as we've discussed, I get that you're saying gold helps maintain value, but do you see a side system where people are, are trading in gold coins, where there is essentially a black market, if you will, where gold is used for transactions where people want to avoid government oversight? Do you see that happening? Look, um, it, it's always a mistake to underestimate human ingenuity. If people want to find a way to trade in gold, they will find a way to trade in gold. And unless the government really wants to turn their society into a police state, they're going to find it very, very difficult to prevent that from happening. Um, now, some governments might think that's a fine idea. They want to become a police state. I don't know how your government feels. I don't know how my government feels about that necessarily. Sometimes they act that way. Sometimes they don't. Uh, but look, if people want to find a way to use gold, they will find a way to use gold. Now, whether that will be something which is uh, easy to do in whatever financial regulatory regime is imposed alongside CBDCs, I suspect it won't be that easy to do. But then perhaps some countries out there in the world will decide that they'll be trailblazers, they'll be innovators, and they'll 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 find a way to set something up. And then if some portion of the BRICs or other countries decide, wow, that's actually a clever technology. That's actually a clever way to trade using physical gold to settle imbalances and whatnot. Do you mind if we uh, sort of you know, purchase your system or, 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 or use it and participate in it to do some rather large transactions? Hey, you know, the technology might well be innovated in the private sector, which is ultimately uh, adapted in a way that allows the public sector to transform itself into a more gold-oriented direction. It could happen. We can be hopeful that that process would be well, relatively less disruptive as opposed to relatively more. But one way or another, if people want to re-monetize gold de facto, they will find a way to do so. History is very instructive in that regard. Well, history has also shown us, John, that governments take extreme measures to protect their power, including confiscating gold, as has happened in the past. Is that something that you see could become an increasing risk? Well, this is why if you're concerned about your home jurisdiction, make sure that you store physical gold, if you can, in a foreign jurisdiction with strong property rights. This is perhaps the reason why places like Switzerland, uh, Singapore, and a few others, uh, notwithstanding being relatively small countries, have huge uh, gold depository uh, custodial businesses. And, and so that's one way to do it. The fact is, if, if for example, the Canadian government came after a, a Canadian person's gold, but it wasn't even in the country, I mean, would that be recognized by a foreign government without evidence of severe criminal wrongdoing and due process? Um, it, it would look sort of arbitrary. And, and this is why I've long since argued that in contrast to any digital currency, and that, that would include a cryptocurrency in my opinion, Gold acts as a physical monetary 
habeas corpus. That's the Latin term for something that must be physically seized. Um, and if it is physically seized, you must have some explicit legal legal reason for doing so. That is, you can't you can't just pretend you haven't done it. It's too obvious. You you can't break into someone's house to confiscate their gold without breaking into their house. And that's the advantage of a physical asset being the last recourse to financial freedom, because physical violation of your person or your property is such a fundamental violation of human rights. It's very, very different than just freezing your bank account. The two aren't regarded in quite the same way. And that's yet another reason why I feel gold is the ultimate backstop for financial freedom, notwithstanding what some people believe are the superior qualities of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, for example. So you did touch on Bitcoin. You don't think that, I can tell clearly, you don't think that Bitcoin could be a way for people to hedge against the dangers of CBDCs, or you don't see Bitcoin as potentially being the basis for this new uh, monetary standard that we may shift into. Well, look, I don't, I, I don't see sovereign nations uh, trusting a Bitcoin internet network uh, to the same degree they would trust physical gold in their own custody or physical gold in a neutral jurisdiction that they trust. I don't think the two are in the same league. And certainly when it comes to the concept of a monetary habeas corpus, that is something with value that is physical, that requires actual violence against an individual to seize, I don't think Bitcoin is in the same league as gold. And, and and there's another way, a more fundamental way, and this is going to get a little bit a little bit spiritual. But let me go there for a moment. There's another way in which I believe gold is superior to cryptocurrency, including Bitcoin. The fact is, notwithstanding the genius it embodies, and I do believe it's genius, Bitcoin was created by man. Cryptocurrencies were created by man. Any future cryptocurrency was created by man. Anything that is created by man can be corrupted, abused, manipulated, debased, and messed with by man. No matter what apparent safeguards have been put by man into it. Whereas Mother Nature, God, the universe, call it whatever the hell you want, created gold. And gold has unique properties in the physical universe that cannot be manipulated by man, no matter how much we try. And that, to me, is simply a different grade of asset. It's just on a different level. It's eternal. It existed before we did. It will exist after we're long gone. Bitcoin cannot make the same claim, nor can any technology created by man. All right. On that divine note, John, one final question. Is this idea, though, of a CBDC inevitable or could there still be some religious, spiritual, whatever you want to call it, enlightenment, staying with that theme that derails this idea? Well, look, I, I like to believe that countries that purport to be democracies really only have political legitimacy if they demonstrate that they recognize and allow dem democratic product processes to work uh, and to work in an open, transparent, and generally healthy way. If the general public starts to push back on this and they still force it on the general public anyway, that will undermine their legitimacy. And history does suggest that when governments undertake actions that undermine their legitimacy, they tend to lie to fuse on just how long uh, they're going to last. Now, things can get very unpleasant after that while the fuse is burning. And of course, they get most unpleasant of all when the bomb goes off. But again, human ingenuity being what it is, we always find a way to rebuild. We always find a way to bounce back. Uh, it can be a little dark and unpleasant going through that part of the cycle, what I call the monetary cycle of history, from good money to debased money and back to good money again. That can be pretty nasty, but it does come back. The cycle does assert itself in the end. We always come back to good money. We will again this time. I'm absolutely 100% certain of that. Okay, we will leave it on that positive and optimistic note. John Butler, thank you very much. My pleasure, Michelle. And as always, thank you for watching. There is, in fact, a special offer for our viewers from our sponsors, Prime XBT. 
where you can receive a deposit bonus of up to $7,000 with a promo code KITCO. The details are in the description. Check it out. And as always, make sure to subscribe. For me, Michelle McCory, and the rest of the team, see you soon. On the Spot with Michelle McCory is brought to you by Prime XBT, the leading cryptocurrency trading platform.